Welcome to the Lean Blog Podcast. Visit our website at www.leanblog.org. Now, here's your host, Mark Graben. Hi, this is Mark Graben, and welcome to episode 385 of the podcast. My guest today is Emily Elrod. She's the president of the firm Worksby, based in Georgia. So Emily and I have shared interest in lean, ergonomics, healthcare, and creating better workplaces. We met earlier this year. She was kind enough to interview me for her YouTube channel. You can find a link to that and a lot more by going to leanblog.org 385. So as Emily describes in the episode, her career has evolved from designing manufacturing equipment to wellness and lean in a health system and then to her own firm, which she calls her WISE framework. It's an acronym that means to work well, intelligent, safe, and empowered. She's good with the phrase. She'll also talk about the need to be H-O-T, hot, humble, open, and transparent. We'll talk about the psychology of change and more. As Emily says, I think the biggest threat to health promotion is doing things to people instead of with them. I hope you enjoy the conversation. You can go to leanblog.org 385 to find links uh, to Emily's firm. If you want to watch the episode uh, via YouTube, you can do so there or through uh, my YouTube channel. Just search for Lean Blog Interviews. Thanks for listening. We're joined today by Emily Elrod. She's the president of her company, Worksby. Emily, how are you? Very well. Thank you so much, Mark. Good to talk with you today. Yeah, it's great. Great to have you here. And could you start off um, introducing yourself and your professional background uh, for the audience? Uh, yes. So I am the business owner of Worksby. And so our goal at Worksby is to help communities and organizations to create environments and design environments where people can thrive, not only at home um, and work, but also play. So all three together. And my background is a weird one, as I was an engineer before I used to, I was an ergonomical engineer. So I used to design machinery for the carpet industry. And then I ended up switching over to the people side of the equation and designing environments now. Hmm. And since then, I've been having a fun time just helping organizations to kind of spark humanity and bring that back and optimizing for purpose. Yeah. So what led, do you think, um, to that shift in, in your focus and in your interest? Did that feel like a, a natural evolution or was there a moment or some sort of spark for that? Um, I decided I like people more than machines on most days. <laughs> so, and it was like, okay, it just wasn't, I just wasn't getting what I needed out of it. And it was great. I could design things that can help people steal of it, but that's what I kept gravitating for is that I am helping on the health equation of making sure that things are ergonomically designed. So people won't have different injuries or what it may be. But then I kept looking at the work environment. I'm like, these people are stressed out. I'm like, this is just like the baby part of it. There's so much bigger to what work environments can do and can be for their people. So I guess um, it's fair to say, maybe you can elaborate first off a little bit on um, ergonomics. Um, you know, ergonomics is one component of physical safety. Mm -hmm. Physical safety is one component of broader safety yet again, right? Mm -hmm. So ergonomics is basically anything that you do over and over and over and over again, a repetitive approach, looking at it, how we can make it to where our bodies are naturally designed. So everybody's hands are all different sizes, but there's a general spec on everybody's hand. We know that we typically go towards right dominant people because that's what and so designing machinery where it plays into factor what the most likely human is going to be using it on a repetitive basis. And, you know, is, is that something companies are paying, I hope companies are paying more attention to? I mean, when I was at General Motors 25 years ago, um, I went and got formal ergonomics training. Mm -hmm. It was a joint um, GM UAW effort. 
And even with that training, and of course, that was something the union supported, it was still kind of an uphill battle sometimes too. It's easy, I think, you know, maybe, you know, for leaders who don't do the work to be dismissive, unfortunately, about ergonomics. And then as I've been in healthcare, it seems like there's still a big opportunity. You're, you're nodding your head. Can you tell us a little more? About yes. That? So right now with everybody going virtual, ergonomics is really starting to hit up and be another, I want to say buzzword slightly to it because it's impacting safety. So what I have found is when claims start coming up with it, it then starts to be another hot topic because now we have people that are repetitively were in more ergonomically designed environments at their office area now are out of the office at their house and they're making up their own little designs of how they can have their workspaces. Some are sitting in closets and having like hour long talks just so that they can have a space. And so finding ways um, I seen one company was given a thousand dollars just for ergonomic design um, approved seating, mm-hmm. and so th- those are some things that have been really hot right now. But I will say, just in general, anything that affects safety, the physical safety, is really a hot thing right now. Even if you're in it um, in a work environment or if you're at home, yeah. work environment. Yeah, and and that's making me mindful of uh, my posture. Um, <laughs> my chair and, and my desk. But yeah, I mean, there's, there's, you know, I imagine if somebody uh, is working all day, um, you know, sort of slumped in a couch with the laptop on their desk or other, other situations that can cause different physical muscular skeletal problems, right? Yes. And low back pain is the number one. And anybody that's been in claims analysis, that is the one that we just avoid like a plague because it never stops. It's you're, back in, in your, your core area can really have some, can lead to secondary injuries and such. So to say the least, we want to avoid those at all costs and ways that can easily be done is looking at the ergonomics of it. And, but like I was saying earlier, it's like, there's so much more, yes, our back pain, but what about the stress that's induced? What about how are we having to deal? Why are we sitting for 10 hours now? You know, why is movement or wellness not being um, promoted? Mm -hmm. Why is there not also mental well-being so that we take spaces to stop? And so those are actually bigger parts of the ergonomic design that a lot of people don't don't go for or don't look at. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so maybe let's um, maybe we'll we'll start a conversation from thinking about um, hands and wrists, you know, thinking about keyboards and heights and mm-hmm. mouse, or I've got a, a trackpad here. Um, but um, I, I don't know. I mean, uh, is, is mental ergonomics, is there a parallel there where you can think of, like you said, repetitive stress as opposed to a discrete acute event? Like I, I had some really bad back pain to start the year. Welcome to 2020. And uh, I, I can't pinpoint any moment if someone asks, when did you hurt yourself? I'm like, I don't know. I don't know if that was the effect of ergonomics. Um, it certainly wasn't because of a, a car accident or some moment where I was lifting something. Or, or is there a parallel, do you think, to accumulated um, mental stressors when we're looking at a, a broader wellness perspective? Because you have to look at it. Ergonomics is a repetitive approach that is done in a physical environment so that's your body moving. We can't see our mind, but we know that half of our day is ran on autopilot. So half of our day is based on repetitive thinking patterns that we've done for a long time. Our environment can definitely induce those. So I do see a huge correlation. And I feel like it's a big part that companies miss out on is that looking at our what we say is our thoughts lead to our feelings, which leads to our actions, which lead to our behaviors. A lot of people don't look at their actions until they have a feeling, until you feel your back hurting, you know, or there, there's different things that you have. And so we have to really play the game of seeing where are we at and where do we want to be, which, I, again, I think is all about more of the lean approach that we talk about a good bit is that where are we at, where do we want to be, 
And how can we use knowledge and tools and resources to get action? Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, so you, you mentioned lean and maybe just stepping back a minute before we explore more about wellness. What, were you exposed to lean or other improvement methodologies when you were working in uh, the carpet industry or, or elsewhere? Um, elsewhere, so in the carpet industry, I saw a little bit and we always had different approaches. It's it like if something didn't go right, we always had either like a Kaizen to go see it and see how it works and whatnot. Mm -hmm. But the majority of it actually was in healthcare. But what I do say is how our healthcare system did it um, at the time, I do not believe was a it was a reactive approach instead of a preventative approach. And so it really got a bad rap. It was a way to eliminate people. And instead of finding in innovative processes that we could work together and come up with the collaboration, the growth and finding alternatives. So we won't mention names or you know, if we can explore similarly the healthcare side, but um, no, God, uh, gosh, that's, it's unfortunate um, to, to hear that. Um, but, you know, again, like if I'm not stretching the parallels too much, it, it seemed like there are organizations that would likewise take a reactive approach to health and safety or wellness, a company that reacts to every accident, maybe in some cases blaming people or saying, well, we're going to replace them with automation as opposed to being um, more proactive. And, you know, the thing that always appealed to me about ergonomics is that it, it is very much a proactive analysis that can be done to identify risks mm -hmm. and prevent injuries instead of just responding to them, which to me, I think, you know, is a, a, an important dimension of, of lean thinking. What, what, mm -hmm. what are some of your thoughts on that? I agree. And that it's the part is that as somebody that does wellness, well-being, whatever, it's it's all a prevent or preventative approach. And so whenever I'm even going from designing machinery to designing environments, it's still a preventative approach. So whenever you come into a reactive, you're fixing a problem. And it's usually you just want to throw a Band-Aid on it and it wants to be a fi quick fix. Comparative, whenever leadership really wants a approach where we can go and we can talk to the people. It doesn't have to be quick. It's one where it can be thought out because a lot of the work that I do is in like well-being, safety, leadership. That's a three to five year strategy at minimum. Mm -hmm. So you can't just throw a Band-Aid on it and have a quick fix because it doesn't work. And you're going to, in essence, have more problems and it's not creative. It's not innovative. It's usually, hey, let's just cut everything by 5%. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a five-year-old can come in and say that. <laughs> so <laughs> you, you don't need, or you trying out your, uh, your MBA education to come up with something so simplistic <laughs> like that. That's a good point. Yes. Yes. And it's like, oh, can we do something more? And that's the more that we work on is, okay. We're not going to focus on waste per se. We're going to focus on frustrations, We're, which frustrations is from stress. What are some of the things that are stressing you out? And it could be a physical stressor or it could be also a mental stressor. And so it opens up, in my opinion, lean thinking and ideology to, to a broader spectrum instead of just looking at a process. So, um, Let's, you know, well, so I, I, I kind of reacting to what you said about um, no quick fix. Like any, any culture change takes time. Um, I mean, again, I think there's a parallel or, you know, uh, sending a few people to ergonomics training <laughs> is not going to change the culture around uh, wellness and safety in an organization, just as sending some people in an organization to lean training if they're engineers, frontline people, relatively low seniority, that's probably not going to change the culture. Um, so gosh, that's discouraging. But I mean, like even at its best, <laughs> even with engaged senior leaders, there's, there's no quick fix, right? No. And that's the one thing that I always come in 
And because it's also preventative, I've never not found an ROI, but let's not start on that, you know, return on investment and the money aspect of it. Because whenever you do in the mental game, it's going to take a long time. You get to eventually see turnover rates. You get to see engagement um, and you get to see those. But those don't come quick either. And so comparative to looking at a process like you can you can see the time that it's taken, like you've reduced your time. But over over amount of time, was it actually valuable if it caused so much stress on people having to do five other things like where are we looking at our data and where are we also looking at our people's feelings and thought processes to make sure that we come for a more, what I say, a human approach. So I always say, um, let's add a pulse to lean. You know, you have the five S's, but can we add something more to it? And looking at instead of a waste side, again, go into the frustration side of it. So in, in the approach that you take, and I want to talk a little more about the, the consulting and the work that you do with different organizations now. I mean, it seems like there are necessary components of where they call it a culture of continuous improvement, making mm-hmm. it safe for people to speak up. Um, whether you turn, you know, you might frame it in terms of psychological safety, like Amy Edmondson, who I've had on the podcast would say. Um, I mean, we've got to make it safe, or maybe you can talk about how you try to help make it safe for people to speak up about frustration so that they're not just labeled as complainers as organizations, unfortunately do sometimes. Yes. Or that they'll complain quote unquote, and it will be a corporate compliance and it's never dealt with. Like they'll say they do like two or three things and then people give their feedback and then it's just like nothing's going to happen with it. So yes, psychological safety is what we speak about a lot. Um, And moreover, as somebody that knows the body well, a physiologist is um, background in physiology and how it works. The one thing I always talk is about how is our body designed? Just like in machinery, if you know something goes wrong with it, you go to the machine and you want to fix it and you go to the engineer. So for me, it's the same thing, but it's in cultures. Like if a culture is not wanting a continuous improvement, like why, why is safety not a value there? Um, they'll have it as a top priority, but that priority keeps shifting down whenever money or money problem happens, you know? And so my question I have for people a lot of the time is how can you bring safety in, but use it from a human approach and our body's actually already done that for us. And um, there's a thing called serotonin. I call it the safety cop of the body. It's our gut reactions. I gave this one example a few months ago when I was talking to somebody or actually was doing a class. And I had a client send me a picture of their leader standing under a massive crane. And I'm like, Why are you standing under a crane having a conversation for one? A yes, the outriggers were out. I don't care. Like common sense would have been, hey, that's not safe or the best idea to do. But then from there, my thought process is, why did the person that sent me the com send me the picture not say anything? Mm. And it goes to the fact that they did not have that gut reaction, neither of them, to be like, oh. This is not something that people should be doing. This is something that we should have a conversation about. And so that's the reason why it's the importance of psychological safety. And and you could do it in so many ways um, of building it. And the one that I think is most is just what I say is be a hot human, which is humble, open and transparent. Hmm. Have these conversations, have these dialogues with people about how they're feeling, have check-ins, mental well-being check-ins. Like you will be surprised how much that will create a sense of safety and connection. But the other part of that though is if you elicit for feedback and you do not do anything with it, you're destroying it as much as if you ask for the feedback. If that makes sense. So, so say that again. So, you, if you if you ask for, if you ask for the feedback, say I, I would frame it in terms of um, 
if you ask for feedback or ideas and don't do anything about it, you end up net net worse off than if you had never asked for feedback. Correct. You, Correct. you were, is that, is that what you were saying or a little? Yes, because the, the fact is, is that you have opened up and you're like, I'm going to listen and you've given all this and it's like, you did a feedback, sir. Okay. Example. One of a client that I had, they did a survey. Feedback came back over uh, where the large majority of the population was stressed out. So over 78% of the population was stressed out. We got the feedback. They took an, a year for them to even do anything with it. Mm. And then from there, whenever we went into the HRO meetings with the HR people, they're like, well, we didn't ask what safety or we didn't ask what stress, what type of stress it was. So they totally dismissed it. And I'm like, have you walked in and talked to any of your people? Do you know your people? I'm like, they're stressed. And if you don't believe that, let's go to the claims and I will show you there how stressed they are. You know, there's so much, but it's just, I don't, I don't know. They want to, sometimes people want to live in fantasy worlds or they just don't know how to address it. So we just kind of avoid it. And, and I wonder, you know, going back to the crane scenario that you talked about with the picture, was it the person didn't sense the danger um, or did they not, did they not know how to speak up to the, which is, I guess, a form of not feeling comfortable. I think it's a double approach. Mm-hmm. On that, because the guy that's talking, he's the leader. You're literally leading by example, and you're standing underneath a crane and having that conversation. So one for him, it never registered in his gut to say, hey, and serotonin never went off for him. Let's just say that the safety cop of the body did not say, hey, this is probably not a good idea. So going back, if we want to even bring it back more to the ergonomics, is this is a repetitive thought. This probably is not his first time he's ever done this. And he is just in a state of autopilot. Mm -hmm. But so was the person that sent the picture. They were in the state of the autopilot. There was no action done. They're they're like, hey, what do you think about this as a safety person? You know, but my response is, why didn't you say anything, you know, and now it's too late and it's after where there's all these excuses or whatnot. But for me, action is very important with no matter what we do, yeah. you have to have action. Um, if you're eliciting feedback, if you want to create safe spaces to have conversations, whatever it is, you have to have that. And, you know, if, if ergonomics is about, um, you know, sort of, you know, being proactive and intentional about how we design equipment, work spaces, things like that. Um, it kind of makes me wonder again, like if there's a parallel, do we need to um, have preparation, mental preparation for different scenarios that somebody might be in? Um, you know, I think of like, you know, one example, when we were selling our home in Orlando, um, a realtor, a real estate agent came into the condo and we talked in advance about wearing masks and I'll wear a mask and you wear a mask. And it was the, it was still very early in the mask thing. And um, his mask had fallen down to where his nose was exposed. And even though it shouldn't have been very difficult and there was no, you know, if anything, like I'm the customer and it was my home and I knew the agent because he lived in our building. He was a neighbor. And I still kind of froze in the moment and, you know, cause I, I don't, I, I don't know why. And now I think like the, that had happened a second time. It's not that difficult where I would say, Hey, so-and-so uh, you might not, your, your mask fell down off your nose. Like, you know, it could be a matter of not being aware or not knowing that that's important, but what should have been a simple interaction, I managed to kind of freeze in the moment and I was far enough away from him. And I didn't feel like it was a matter of life and death. But I wonder, like, from that or other scenarios, can we prepare people to speak up in moments like that? Um, is that anything you've ever addressed? How to, how to prepare people um, to speak up about safety or something in a workplace? 
And that's, it's kind of the work that I do around is helping people to understand how their bodies are designed so that whenever things like that happen, that was a freeze moment. So whenever you freeze, typically it is this cortisol that is released. So cortisol, what I call it is the angry coworker of the body. Mm -hmm. And not that you were angry, but it still was that response that you have from it. So it's, you can fly, fight or freeze, but we actually are finding there's more responses too of care and connect. So they can go deeper into whenever you have a stimulus that makes us aware of something, but we don't reach out and say something. So what I tell people is to one, know your body. And know whenever you're freezing. Typically in work environments, we freeze because we can't fight and we typically can't fly. We can't leave the room. We're in a board meeting and it's like, oh, they just said something and we should call them out. But we don't. So there's two importance to that is one building relationship prior so that you have the ability to say something. Like you said, that was a friend of yours. And like the other situation, that was somebody that they speak candidly about a million other items, but it was this one. It was like, Oh, it's so uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. So I ask a lot of times, what are some of your uncomfortable moments and explore it a little bit more. When are times that you have froze? When are you times? Because this is the other thing that I do with safety. You know, this is a common thing. It says stop and think. Well, whenever people release cortisol, that angry coworker of the body they literally can't think mm-hmm. they can stop like you stopped and you knew, but you can't think because it shuts off your learning centers of your brain that you can't progress on. And you, in essence, freeze or you'll fight or fly or whatever your natural tendency is. And so that's really an important key for people to understand that our body is already telling us ahead of time what we need to do mm-hmm. if we just listen to it. So, in- oh, go ahead. And leaning into that discomfort. And it takes time. Mm-hmm. That's what what you were saying earlier, practicing it. You know, it's not something that people do over a night or a day. You've literally been doing this same thinking patterns or thoughts that are feelings, which lead directions, which are behavior. So you've been feeling this, you know, this, this, this frustration or this, this moment of like, oh, it's awareness. Mm-hmm. But you've been doing that for, in essence, since childhood. <laughs> So you have to work individually with people, but also with companies. And again, it's, it's not a quick fix. It's a long-term culture, but it makes a difference. Mm-hmm. So what, I mean, what advice would you have? Um, so if you feel that moment, whether it's, you know, kind of stress coming on or you feel like you're freezing or your heart rate's up or something. I mean, the one strategy you know, for people to talk about is as simple as taking a deep breath. Is It doesn't, I mean... It does. Yeah, that helps. Um, So your body wants to be in its home state, which is homeostasis is what its home state is. And that's in essence what breathing does. So cortisol is actually not released very long. It's really only 90 seconds. And so there's a few things that you can do is you can do the breath. You can do that deep breath. There's other things that you can do is actually just tapping your wrist. Or if you can't tap your wrist, just feel your chair. And one of the cool things that I also like is whenever you're stressed or angry, your tongue typically goes to the top of the roof of your mouth. And if you relax your tongue, because people can't see that, (laughs) if you relax your tongue, you'll be, you'll, you'll feel your body actually all drop. And in, in that aspect, you're, you're coming back to your home state and it's ways to, to own your body so that other people don't own it for you. Well, so, I mean, that's really interesting then to think about, yeah, these, I mean, these connections between the physical body and your mental state. And I mean, whether you frame it in terms of your happiness or your job performance or the safety of people around you, that's uh, not something I've really thought or learned much about over time. So that's, that's, that's interesting. Well, and that's- I think that's the cool part that I get so nerdy and I love what I do is that I don't think it's been explored much in in the work environments that literally half your payroll is based on humans, but yet we don't put our environments where humans can thrive. Mm. You know, if you do that, 
you can have more effective teams. It's Google's research on Aristotle Project. You know, it's all about um, the number one thing is um, psychological safety, creating that space. And that's so that you feel like you're going to have those conversations. So you won't freeze up. So you can be more innovative and look at processes and go deeper and farther together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, I want to talk about the work you're doing now, but maybe if we just in the context of, you know, telling your career arc from step to step to step, you um, were working in the carpet industry and then you mentioned working in healthcare. I was wondering if you could talk about that transition um, and, and talk about healthcare as much as, as you want, but or you know, talk about your transition into having your company Worksby and what you you know kind of learned in those transitions. So for me, like I said, I, I transitioned from the carpet textile industry to um, going into the healthcare. I loved what I did with people, but again, I I like people more than machines most days. Mm-hmm. That's what I always joke. <laughs> And so whenever I got into healthcare, I learned really quickly that as somebody that even has a background, like in health and wellness, you know, we talk about sleep, route, exercise and all these things. But again, stress was the number one thing that affected people. It was the things that were shutting off their learning centers. So I could give you the knowledge, but if you didn't care for it and you were too stressed about things that are happening at work or at, at home, It didn't matter. So for me, after doing a wellness program the wrongest way possible, I had to do a re-strategy because I literally had somebody come up to me and said, I hate you. And basically, why are you still here? Like, I thought you were with the insurance company. You're still here. Why? And as somebody that loves people, I'm like, oh, you want to ask why? Why are they unhappy (laughs) that you're there? What was going on? And so for me, what, what we were doing is in the wellness industry, which it's starting to phase out, is that we really relying on data and data is great, but we were prodding and poking people and I, and I have a farm, so we have cows and that's literally what we were doing. We were lining people up for the, the thoughts of safety and wellness because we want to know their data so that we can help them, but that's not what we were doing. Because in essence, we were forcing change onto people. We never elicited their feedback. Mm. And from that idea, I got the mindset, the healthiest lifestyle that you're ever going to live is the one that you're going to live. And so I fully embraced um, what is called the self-determination theory. It's Desi and Ryan. And it is all about autonomy, competence, and relatedness. So um, starting with competence. So give them the knowledge. Give them the knowledge to know what they need to be doing, then autonomy, give them the freedom of choice, especially in a free choice country. <laughs> like, right. Then you go into work and then you have no choice. Like it's a fundamental right for humans, but especially I think for Americans that we want to have choice mm-hmm. and then it's got to be relatable. So one thing that kept happening with, the vendor that we were working with is they kept sending us stuff about life in the snow. I'm in Georgia. (laughs) I've probably seen one inch of snow like in five years. So it was not relatable. It was like, they don't even understand me. And what I've later learned in the work that I do is that whenever you don't make things relatable, it then becomes a us versus them mentality which is really hurtful in cultures and climates that you're wanting to build more. You have to be relatable to people. You have to know their wants, their needs, um, their frustrations. And and so I'm sitting here fidgeting with, um, I'm not wearing it at the moment, but I have my Fitbit charge two that I've had for a while. And since, you know, I work for myself, um, Mm -hmm. I, I bought this. It was my choice to buy this. Um, I wear it. Okay. Like, you know, what, what do I really do with the data around how much I'm exercising and how much I'm sleeping? I guess there's more of a curiosity factor than anything, but to your point that this was my choice to buy it. It's my choice to wear it. Um, I know people who work for organizations, including health systems where something like this is very much mandated or at mm-hmm. least there's, 
I don't like the analogy of the carrot and the stick because people aren't donkeys, but you know, there's this idea of like, they're, they're, they're kind of offering the carrot of, well, we're going to, you can also view it as a stick. Your healthcare will be more expensive if you don't wear the Apple watch or the Fitbit and we will give you one. But I, I, I hear a lot of grumbling about those programs and people joking, I think they're joking about like, oh, well, I put the Fitbit on my dog and I let the dog run around the yard because I have to get my minimum steps like that, that something like that creates, I imagine, feelings of oppression or it's distracted people from what should hopefully be intrinsic motivations for health and wellness, right? Exactly. And that's the point that going back to the healthiest lifestyle you're going to live is one that you're actually going to live. What if they don't like to go for a walk? Mm-hmm. What if they don't, but yet they like to do either meditation or breathing, or if it is something that they can't measure via steps, but they're swimming, you know, what about these different avenues that you can have data, but you're only letting them measure their sleep and their walking ability. You know, that's not, it's not fair and it's not relatable and you're not giving them choice. And so I think the coolest thing that showed from that is I was blessed to be able to be named top 10 in the nation at what I do at my Wellcoa. And it was all related back to this, giving people choice. Mm -hmm. Because whenever I did that, my engagement grew. grew. And where other people were having around 35 to 50% participation rate, um, or not participation rate, sorry, engagement rate. So they Mm -hmm. actually do the full program, all of it. We were having an 87%. Mm. And we were blowing it out of the water, but we were allowing them to have choices because if people want to work on their stress first, do it. Everybody's at their own different stages of life. Mm -hmm. And so what works for me will not work for you. And what works for you will not possibly may have some semblance, but it won't work fully. Mm. And and so then what was the transition to, to starting your own company? When, when did you do that? And kind of what, you know, that's a leap. That, uh, yeah. What, 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 so the leap came from, and, and I'll tell you, my company's name called WorkSpeed. And it's because the goal is to take human workers that sometimes feel like their data and their numbers and they're not actual people and letting them to be human beings. So it's the B part of it. But in the space of being and be, being a human being, you actually want to work. So in work speed, there's a Z and the Z goes backwards, um, both or points both directions because that is called purpose. And where I was at a point in my life where I was frustrated, we were doing a lean approach. um, And in that lean approach, we had to tell everything that we were doing every minute of the day, every hour of the day, how many emails we sent out. I was managing 10,000 people like 10,000 people, one person. And so I thought that would show the effectiveness um, because I had different systems that allowed me to to help out. And then I also had time where I went and I talked to people. I went and it's very important to know your people and have days that you come in and just mingle and just, hey, how you doing? Check-ins, high fives, you know. But I had to start recording it. And so I was spending literally 10 hours each week and I was already working 60 hour weeks. So now I'm at 70 hours and it just, it didn't work. So I was blessed to be um, leap out and I had actually fortune 500 company. I ended up um, contracting with and we did their well-being and safety programming. And from there, I got to work on the approaches that I know that work and focusing on stress, frustration. Yes, sleep, food, mood, and movement matter, but let's start at the beginning and seeing what are some of the ways that our systems are designed and the way that we engineer environments. And instead of blaming the outcomes, we actually look at how have we created things that may lead to the outcomes. And so back to your like back back to your workplace example, just one one more time. You were working on building relationships with the intent of getting better outcomes, and it sounds like that was being dinged as non-productive chit chat. Yep. <laughs> Yikes. 
Yes. And that's the thing where sometimes we want to be so efficient. But what I say is you can't be efficient with people. You can be effective. Right. Because, again, human beings are human beings. We are the only creatures on this planet that have the ability to grow and create futures. But we also have a time for dialogue and we're not very predictable. So if you look at data of a process that you or engineering or maybe the splice times or something that I've done in textile, like I know the timing because it is computer based. It's very automated approach. It doesn't put a people factor or the human factor into it. So it's a double edged sword. Yes. Humans are more likely to mess up in essence, quote unquote, mess up. But they're also going to give you the greatest benefit for growth and a future and innovation. So you can't you can't have one without the other. And sometimes we really focus on being efficient and not really looking at being effective. Yeah. Yeah. And um, so it's great that you have the opportunity then under your own banner to go and help build. Um, programs and work with organizations the way you want to work with. Uh, yeah. Yes. And, and now we, we focus on what is called a wise approach. Mm-hmm. So we want to bring wisdom to the workforce and um, and work environment. And that is being, we think well-being is extremely important. That's holistic well-being. You're a human. So let's embrace that. Then we do intelligence, which is emotional intelligence. So how do we have those tough conversations, but also process improvement. There are times that we have to look at what we're doing and how we are going about a process, especially with micromanaging and especially with how some things are just not, like I said, they're not effectively done or efficiently done. So let's look at that. And then safety from a psychological safety, but also physical and then empowerment. Empowerment is that purpose side that's also um, diversity, inclusion, equity aspect to it. Bringing those all together because all those things affect humanity and our human and how can we create wise environments so that we can get the work done that, that we are there for. Right. And so I love that acronym. Yeah. Wise. Um, and in intelligence, um, I think it's great that you've got, um, I'll call it, you know, EI and PI, mm-hmm. personal intelligence in process improvement going hand in hand, because, you know, I think that's, that's one of the things that trips, well-intended young engineers up. I mean, I have been guilty of that. I, I share some stories in, in the book, Practicing Lean, that I wrote and um, edited of, you know, being kind of, you know, the gung-ho, well-intended engineer who ironically, like around ergonomics projects, I shared one story back from my time at General Motors. I was well-intended and I was trying to work on behalf of others, but I wasn't engaging them properly. And, um, you know, I didn't have um, the emotional intelligence or the workplace intelligence to really um, navigate that more smoothly than, um, than, than I did. So, um, yeah. So, I mean, do you see, do you get opportunities now when you, when you talk about um, leadership coaching, what, what, what sort of conversations or coaching do you do to try to help develop emotional intelligence or, or other dimensions that you, that you talk about here with leaders? So a big part that we, big subjects I'll say that we speak on is one, stress management. Everybody's stressed out right now. And then also in essence is innovation management or we call it frustration eliminations. So it's kind of taking a lean approach, but again, focusing on the frustrations of it. And those are the two things that it's a lot of self-awareness, asking questions, starting with a what, then a how, then going into a why. And we do a reverse because that's how our psychology and our brain is. It's easier to answer a what question than a why because a why is uh, mixed with feelings. Mm -hmm. And so we go, just look at it more of an objective approach. So with leaders, starting out objective. And then also the big part is, is getting eliciting feedback from their people because whenever you look from your point of view, you're only seeing from your point of view in essence. So you need a wider lens and bold leaders 
will go out and wise leaders will go out and elicit responses that are from everybody. And I think one of the coolest things that I like to do is there's in safety, we do it in safety, but we also do it in leadership. But there's people that see problems. There's people that talk about problems. There's people that think about problems. There's people that do things about problems. Mm-hmm. The first time I learned this, I came back and I had a, a person. We were, I was actually in the healthcare system at that time still. And it, it was like such a demonstration of what I had just learned. There was a guy that had found a spot of blood found it and all he did was just put a piece of tape to it and said blood. He didn't clean it up. He didn't do anything about it. He just, I was like, ah, and it, but it, the thing is, is that it makes me understand how people are wired too. He's a finder. Like he can see the problem. He didn't do anything about it, hmm. but it's still valuable to have people that can find the problems there. It's valuable people that can have communicate the problems or think about it. engineers are notorious for thinking. And we think and we think and we think and we think in a bubble sometimes and we make it a pretty and how it should be. But having those other members around us and so having leadership that does that does not have yes people around them, they have I I won't know people. I want people that know them, but also have the ability to say no. And we can have our strengths and weaknesses together. Yeah. Well, I mean, I've had similar conversations with leaders when we talk about Um, the Kaizen style of continuous improvement, that sure, ideal state, people would be, people in a department would be equally um, competent and confident and comfortable in uh, finding problems, identifying possible uh, countermeasures, testing them, and then, you know, documenting them. The reality is, like you said, some people are great at pointing out problems they would have been labeled the complainers in the past, but you can build off that, right? Then there's some people who are kind of blind to the waste, if you will. But once it's been pointed out, they start thinking of solutions. Mm -hmm. Maybe they're not the people who like to follow things through. And there's someone else on the team who may follow it through. And then they might not have the computer skills to help document and share something. And so you can have handoffs, Mm -hmm. and teamwork. But then I think you can also do do things to help develop um, competence and confidence in those different things. Help the doers also get better at identifying problems and help the problem finders get better at taking action and and trying to figure out, you know, is is it fear-based where they're afraid they might do the wrong thing? I think leaders can do a lot to help set a tone to try to eliminate some of that fear, easier said than done, but worth, but worth trying. Yes. And I agree so much because that's the thing is that when you know your strengths and your weaknesses and you know where you're at on that spectrum too, you can go to the person that that's their strength and ask some more detailed questions on what's your process to do this? Mm -hmm. What do you do? And for them, they can create a strategy that helps them to learn and to grow and let them fail. Fail safely, mm-hmm. but let them try and let them fail through learning, you know, and that's that's the other part that I always speak with leaders like, no, not every lean approach or frustration elimination has went perfect. None of them's going to. But we sometimes consultants will put this idea that if we come in, we're going to give you all these answers and we're going to do it all perfect. But you're learning. And so finding ways that you can learn, adapt, mentor and grow together and start creating that wise environment which then helps in and goes down into the health aspect. And it's, it's all interconnected, but sometimes we just don't see it that way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So um, maybe one other thing we can talk about here, you know, you're helping people in workplaces who you're working with directly. And then the way you and I cross paths, um, I thank you for having me as a guest with some of the videos that, um, that you do uh, on YouTube, the conversations that you have with people. But I was wondering if, if you could talk about those because you mentioned bold leaders. That's one of the, you've been doing a series mm-hmm. on that. And if you can talk about, um, talk about those, like even, you know, back to you know, how you got started doing that and, and why you do them and, you know, what they're about, where people can find them. Can we talk about yes. that a little bit? So I do a series right now it's called unapologetically bold. Mm -hmm. I'm not sorry for, 
And it's about people in my experiences have kept apologizing for things that just make them human. And it's things like I had somebody the other day calling people. I'm not and her thing is I'm not sorry for calling people out on their BS, you know, and there's a way to do it. And she talks about emotional intelligence and about how doing it kindly and then revert on another one I had about um, Hayden. He spoke about how being powerfully kind. And at times we usually have people that are people pleasers that are kind and then or we'll have somebody that's very assertive and how to mesh them together and how they can beautifully complement each other. But there that's just what it is. It's it's on our YouTube channel, Live Wise Worksby. And our goal is to continue to bring the power of not only positivity and positivity is not like rainbows and butterflies, whatnot. It's about finding ways that we can have real conversations that will lead to action. And again, wisdom is knowledge and action. And so what are ways that we can do that and be leaders, be strong leaders for one another? So we can stop apologizing and bringing things that what I'm learning, many people deal with, but they've never talked about it. Yeah. So people uh, can find you on YouTube. They can search your name, Emily Elrod. They can search Worksby. Mm -hmm. And then you also can find me on LinkedIn, Mm -hmm. which is where I'm I'm majority of the time at is, is on the LinkedIn community as well. And we also have a wise work community. You're more than welcome to join in on that. And those are just discussions. And I like to promote ideas and thinking for people who are like you, Mark, like you talk about how relationships are a big part of the lean approach, which has never been taught to me. And I think slowly it is learning new ways that can affect the next generation. Mm -hmm. And that's my goal is to continue to bring wisdom and knowledge and action to work environments. Yeah. Well, that's a great goal. I, I like and appreciate what you're doing. Uh, in uh, in, the, in that realm and um, yeah so I look forward to more of those videos I've uh, I'll recommend to everybody subscribe and turn on the notifications so that you get pinged um, when those are happening because you have a lot of uh, interesting guests present company <laughs> so you have you have the show anyway and you have a lot of interesting people yes <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you uh, again for that and um, uh, any any last word um, that, that you might want to share with the listeners and, and the viewers, the, you know, I say viewers, people who are watching on my YouTube channel. Yes. So I guess the thing that I do want, cause I know this is very much based towards a lean approach. There's one thing I want to talk to people about is adding a pulse to lean. And what we say is pulse is an acronym for prior, prioritize with your time and remove frustrations, make it user friendly with clear expectations Learn and implement best practices. Again, what we were talking about, finding ways to learn and grow. Standard set with progression, not perfection. And then finally, use an environment that is wise and people focused. Profits are great, but if you focus on your people, your profits will show up. So just let's add a little pulse to lean and and give it a little people side to it because it's Lean is amazing. It, it does great work, but too many times I've seen people have a negative feeling towards it because of past reactions and past situations. Yeah. Well, so maybe a final thought to compare and contrast. And I appreciate how you're good with acronyms and, and these phrases. Um, but what you were describing, unfortunately, um, leads to people thinking the word lean stands for less employees are needed. Yes. Negative and demoralizing and sad. But I've also heard um, people say it could stand for let's engage all now. Let's engage all people. Mm-hmm. And that's, and that's what, what it should be. Yeah. And I think it can be. Um, so, and that, and that's a stance for anybody that is a lean practitioner. If you are put in that moral obligation where you are going towards the first, the first one, the first lean, just know that you are having a long-term effect on others. And whenever things, processes could be effective and efficient, 
in essence, there is now a cortisol response, an angry frustration from a past experience that they're stopping off, no innovation, no growth, and what are you missing out on? Yeah. Great questions, great advice. So um, again, our guest today has been Emily Elrod, and uh, we'll, I'll put links to LinkedIn and, and the YouTube channel and everything in the show notes. So I invite everybody um, to go and um, take a look at that. So um, Emily, thank you for being a guest here on uh, on my turf. I hope you enjoyed the conversation uh, as much as we did when we were having the conversation uh, there on your YouTube. So thanks. yes, I did. Thank you so much, Mark. It's always amazing to talk to you. It's such a fun conversation. Thank you for making it fun. I appreciate it. Awesome. Take care. Thanks for listening. This has been the Lean Blog Podcast. For lean news and commentary updated daily, visit www.leanblog.org. If you have any questions or comments about this podcast, email mark at leanpodcast at gmail.com.